Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome back to uh, our series, uh, Prioritizing Equity, uh, launched by the American Medical Association Center for Health Equity. Uh, my name is Dr. Aletha Maybank, and I am the Chief Health Equity Officer at the American Medical Association. Uh, our role as the Center for Health Equity is really to facilitate a process for centering and embedding equity across all of our work uh, throughout the enterprise. Uh, and amplify that work as well. So it's an honor again, as always, uh, to be here with you. I thank all of those who are joining and all of those who are gonna watch this uh, in the future. I uh, just wanna remind folks we have, um, and, and to visit our Health Equity Resource Center uh, for COVID that is on our AMA website. Uh, we had a great conversation last week um, about uh, what health professionals can do in terms of centering um, anti-racism work. Uh, within their healthcare setting, settings. And next week, we're also gonna talk to a group of uh, physicians who are really working to move upstream, um, addressing the political and structural determinants of health uh, in, in their work and gonna help provide some opportunity. But today, uh, we have an awesome panel uh, to really elevate and speak with um, physicians who are at the intersection of uh, LGBTQ and transgender nonconforming, um, experiences uh, for themselves and also of the, their patients and really to highlight what has been going on, especially at this particular time. You know, last Friday, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the Trump administration reversed an Obama era policy that banned uh, healthcare providers from discriminating against populations, including LGBTQ, women who are seeking abortion and those who need language um, services. This week, the Supreme Court provided big news um, in the advancement of human rights. On Monday, uh, you know, it was a really big day. The Supreme Court upheld civil rights for LGBTQ and transgender workers. And today was announced and upheld that the 650, 100,000 immigrant young people who are um, identified as DACA, the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, also known as the Dreamers, will continue to be able to live and to learn and work in this country. And so with this push towards justice, um, you know, there's this backdrop, though, of COVID-19 and police brutality. And as Audre Lorde, you know, says, there is no thing as a single issue struggle because we do not live single issue lives. And there are continued needs for solidarity. As Audre Lorde also expressed, I am not free while any woman is unfree, even when her shackles are different than my own. And so today um, we have a panel of experts folks who I've known for a while and very much admire um, to speak with you all. Uh, so we have first Dr. Oni Blackstock, if you could just raise your hand very quickly, who's Assistant Commissioner for the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene over the Bureau of HIV. We have Dr. Jesse Ehrenfeld, uh, who is Senior Associate Dean and Director uh, and for Advancing a Healthier Wisconsin Endowment, who's also the former chair of AMA Board. Uh, and one of the reasons why I'm able to be here and speak with you today. So very thankful uh, for, for Jesse and his work and leadership. Um, Dr. David Malbranch, who is <laughs> Associate Professor of Medicine, uh, Director of Student Employee Health Services at Morehouse School of Medicine. Uh, Dr. Shilpen Patel, who is Immediate Past Chair of the AMA LGBTQ Advisory Committee, as well as um, at the Division of Public Health at the Frit sorry, Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center. And then Asa Radix, Dr. Asa Radix, who is Senior Director of Research and Education at Callen Lord Community Health Center, which I'm very familiar with uh, from being here uh, in Brooklyn. So thank you all for joining uh, us today. So I'm going to open up as I always open up. Uh, and it really is about telling about yourselves, where you are, like literally in this world, um, where you are. and how are you doing? So I will start with, let's go with Dr. Blackstock. Oh, wow. Okay, great. Can you hear me okay? Okay, great. Um, so just wanna say my, my pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, I'm in New York City in Harlem, New York. And, you know, I sort of split my time um, working at the health department and also seeing patients at Harlem Hospital. Um, so for the, you know, 
the duration of the pandemic thus far, I've been basically working from home, um, which, you know, has posed its challenges. I think we're all aware to the, of this, um, but also being able to do televisits with many of my patients. And there's like a certain, even though we're not face to face, there is a certain level of intimacy talking to your patients while you're sitting on your couch. I don't know, it's, some, it's something about it that sort of like, makes you feel in some ways closer. Um, so my patients, most of them have my cell phone numbers um, and, and call me. And I guess what I'm seeing is that, you know, I, I take care of mainly black and Latino young men. Many are men who have sex with men. Um, many of them have lost their jobs or are frontline workers. So at increased risk for exposure to COVID-19. Um, and so, you know, it's been probably even more challenging. I think we talk probably a not, lot more than usual because um, I'm trying to like be as supportive, you know, as I can, as a, in, in addition to really engaging in this care remotely, which has its challenges. Absolutely. Thank you. Dr. Aaron Feld? Well, thank you so much. Uh, I am in beautiful Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where I practice at the Medical College of Wisconsin. And, um, you know, this is, this is a strange time. Oh, by the way, I use he, him, his pronouns. Um, given the, you know, the, the stress and the isolation that, that we're all feeling. And so, you know, the question, how are, how are you doing is, is a complex one. Um, you know, it, it's, it's exhausting, uh, sort of, I think what we're all collectively up against, um, the, the stress and the isolation. Um, I learned earlier today that, um, someone uh, who I'm very good friends with, uh, you know, his brother, um, uh, took his life, uh, mm -hmm. this past week. Um, and yet, um, I remain optimistic. I, I, I have tremendous, um, hope in, in the resilience of our nation. Uh, and of, of the LGBTQ community that's been through so much uh, over, you know, so many decades. Uh, and the Supreme Court ruling that you referenced is, is obviously a bright spot, I think, in a lot of our uh, weeks. And so uh, that's kind of where I am. It's a mixed bag. Yeah. Thank you. Dr. Radix? Hi. Um, well, first of all, uh, my pronouns are he or they. Uh, so, and I also wanted to say I'm so grateful to be part of this panel and really in awe of everyone else who's, who's here with me. Um, you know, I'm sitting, actually right now, I'm sitting home in Brooklyn, trying to get some work done. And as you probably know, uh, you know, New York City was one of the hardest hit and very early on, I mean, you know, 200,000, you know, people with COVID and, you know, just shy of 20,000 people who've died. So, I think like uh, many of us, you know, I'm exhausted, you know, I've not been sleeping well. I think uh, as most of us, you know, I've been holding a lot. And I think, uh, you know, part of that is just seeing our communities completely devastated by this pandemic and, and really seeing, I would say like the glaring result of, you know, centuries of, uh, you know, structural racism that systematically impacts the, you know, black and brown communities. So, you know, communities that, you know, I'm part of. So, you know, it, it, it is a, a tough place to be. I, I know there's light at the end of the tunnel, but uh, the isolation is, um, as you said, I think all of this is uh, getting to be a little too much. <laughs> Absolutely, thank you. Dr. Patel? My uh, pronouns are he, him, and his. Um, physically, I'm actually uh, now in San Francisco, um, staying here, and I split my time between seeing patients in the East and South Bay um, and then doing breast cancer research um, between the two. Um, and I think, um, and I feel very honored to be on this panel with really just some amazing people who I consider both peers and you know some of my heroes as well. So really exciting to kind of discuss this. Um, I think for me, probably where I am in terms of all this COVID, like it, it's definitely been kind of this fine line in terms of like taking care of our patients, taking care of our coworkers. Um, and at the same time, like how do you also take care of yourself? Um, you know, because it is, it's really hard to deliver good quality care or do good quality research when you can't take care of yourself. And so um, I think for me, it goes a little bit back and forth between those two to Kind of take care of yourself, take care of your family, and then at the same time, obviously, uh, be there to take care of our community. So um, it's a, it's a very uh, it's definitely been a challenge, and it's one that I feel like I have to navigate every day and kind of ask that question to back and forth. Thank you, Dr. Malbranch. 
Yeah, hey, and um, my pronouns are he, him, his, and also just very thankful, uh, Aletha, and to the AMA for having me on this panel. There are some, some heavy hitters on this panel, so I'm just, I'm honored to be among the group here. Um, I'm in a kind of strange, precarious uh, position in that I've been away from my job at Morehouse School of Medicine since about October when my father fell sick. Used up all my vacation time, my FMLA, my sick time, and then my father passed in early January. And so I'm currently on unpaid leave physically in upstate New York, uh, helping my mother. So um, Sheldon's comments about, you know, how do you take care of yourself and then also taking care of your family and your loved ones and those of us that have uh, children or elders or other family members that depend on us physically, emotionally, financially, a combination of all those things can be a little bit daunting, especially in the context of a pandemic that is decimating black and brown communities and the acute on chronic exacerbation of the racism uh, pandemic that has been centuries old. So um, it is one of those things where it's kind of like oscillating up and down. But I think one of the, the bright spots that I've learned is discovering and rediscovering uh, new talents or old talents that I've probably pushed to the side. So getting back to a lot of my writing, um, doing telehealth uh, more frequently. Um, I can't tell you how many Zoom calls and webinars and things like that. I know all of you can agree with this that I've been invited to over the past three months. Um, and just, you know, all the skills that we have as clinicians, as educators, as activists is phenomenal. I think sometimes we forget um, that being a part of this medical community means being an activist as well. And so I'm just excited to be on this panel and, and part of this series doing this because I think part of being a, a good clinician and being in the medical community is about the activism. So thank you. Absolutely. Thanks to you all for, for your introductions. And kind of to build on what you were just talking about and, and Dr. Blackstock mentioned in terms of um, seeing patients in telehealth, uh, and it doesn't have to be about telehealth specifically, but what is the experience right now? What are you hearing from your, your patients that do identify as LGBTQ or transgender nonconforming? There, there's such an invisibility to the experience overall in, in the media, um, and it's not shared and it's not expressed much or well. And I think it would be really useful and helpful for the audience to hear what are you hearing that's just it's different, it's nuanced, that folks just don't hear about. And then the things that are the same that everybody is experiencing as well. And any of you can kind of take it on and jump in. I mean, I, I think from what I'm hearing, and I hear it more from the community, um, is we know that the LGBTQ population, right, faces considerable disparities, right, when it regards to health, um, risk behaviors, access to competent health care. You know, we know that, you know, the rates of smoking, heavy alcohol consumption, drug abuse, uh, poor mental health are significantly higher in our community uh, than in the general population. And I think what I've seen from friends as well as even my patient population is this is just exacerbated, right, in uh, this kind of shelter in place. You know, San Francisco, we're still essentially sheltering in place if people are not uh, really going out much. Um, and I think, so I have heard from friends are having a hard time finding culturally competent care. Um, and in addition to that, I think it's like there's still a lot of fear that's kind of associated with it. So um, it's been it's been interesting to kind of kind of track that, I guess, for my own, both personal as well as professional. You know, we, we've had, we have a lot of folks that drive to see us, and that's obviously been hard when folks are traveling, traveling distances to get specialized care. Um, the other thing I'll just say is, you know, I, I'd never come out on a Zoom meeting before. Um, it, it's, it's awkward, it's hard, and, you know, um, having sort of authentic conversations with with patients uh, through these platforms is is just um, it's possible, but I, I think it adds another level of complexity that makes it challenging uh, for folks to get the care that, that they frankly need. I, I think um, there's also the reality that not everyone can access telehealth services. I mean, we're seeing an empty health center that mainly serves people who just don't have the ability to have a cell phone, a smartphone that they can do this or have access to the internet, Wi-Fi, computer. Uh, you know, the people who can access it, that's great. But, you know, we need to be thinking about the, 
you know, could be anywhere, you know, 30, 40, maybe even 50% of the folks we serve who are just not able to um, get in contact with us. Um, I think as I was mentioning before, you know, just talking with my, my patients on the phone, you know, sort of, sort of two major buckets are those that are still having to work and obviously concerned about their exposure and others who have lost their jobs and are concerned about housing and where they're going to find, um, you know, their next meal. And just thinking about, you know, how there's the pandemic and then obviously being Black um, and Latinx and then being queer and trans and all of that, you know, sort of compounds the situation. So I think what was probably already a precarious situation for many has just been made um, um, even more so. I think this also just to say, just to talk about like just data collection, you know, we're really limited in terms of the data that we we have and are aware of in terms of how um, LGBTQ, TGNC people are being impacted. Um, you know, there's, um, there's a push here in New York State uh, by one of the state senators, um, who is, is, is out um, and really pushing the State Department of Health to begin collecting this data around COVID-19, but we're already like three months into the pandemic. Um, the trace, uh, contact tracing initiative that's being, um, that's started here in New York City, they will hopefully be collecting um, sex, sexual orientation and gender identity data. But in terms of like being able to really characterize, it's almost like the invisibility that you were talking about is even like hyper invisibility because we you don't have the, the numbers that so many people in, in this culture really are, are need in order to understand sort of the gravity of the situation. But I think we also have sort of the qualitative experiences, you know, of our, of our loved ones, of ourselves and of our patients as well. I think the, the thing that I've seen a lot um, with patients that I've seen also just being in the community is kind of looking at the sense of intimacy um, that has been lost in this COVID-19 pandemic and particularly around the stay at home orders and being disconnected. And if you're looking at, you know, the spectrum of where we live along sexual orientation and gender identity lines, uh, especially for a lot of our trans brothers and sisters and gender non-conforming folk that are already feeling a certain level of being ostracized or isolated, not only from heterosexual spaces, but also from LGBTQ supposedly uh, spaces as well. And, um, you know, it's just been hard for everybody. And so I think when we're talking about mental health and accessing care, that's been a challenging thing as well. And to Asa's point, if, you know, people can't get on, you know, telehealth, how are they coping with the mental health strategies? How are they dealing with the finances? Um, there was a, a wonderful trans sister, I was on a Zoom call yesterday, uh, uh, Tony Michelle Williams, who's an advocate in Atlanta, a trans sister in Atlanta. And she was just talking about some of her sex worker friends in the community who are really having trouble financially and having trouble with you know, being homeless and dealing with a lot of these issues right now that are even compounding what was happening before COVID-19. So I think for ourselves as providers, we have to be cognizant of all those things, that it's not just a simple matter of people getting tested or not being able to get tested or being sick or not being sick. We're seeing this kind of decimate the foundations that didn't really have a foundation for a lot of our communities to begin with. So we have a lot of work to do both on a, a medical level as well as a, every other level in society. I'm so glad you said that because, you know, social engagement is a buffer, right, against the stress that so many folks uh, feel and deal with uh, throughout their, their daily lives. And, and that's been just taken away in so many places. And I think um, it's it's been uh, really compounding the uh, challenges, the anxiety that, that folks are experiencing. Yeah, and I just wanted to also add, um, so I take care of many people who are living um, with HIV, and I think particularly for people who have survived the early days of the AIDS pandemic, um, you know, people are experiencing a lot of um, anxiety. I think people are seeing parallels with sort of government, government inaction or delayed um, responses on part of the federal government. Um, you know, the inequities that we're seeing in certain communities being um, impacted, and also like social isolation, I think particularly for um, some of my patients who are older, um, we, know, we know that social isolation already, um, I think speaking to the issues around sort of intimacy, um, you know, is already an issue for many people who are older, particularly those who are living with HIV, um, many of whom have, you know, lost chosen family um, and friends, um, and so this is further um, compounding a lot of that as well. Absolutely. Um, and so, and then compounding um, the experience of COVID is also um, our recent, um, I guess, media attention around police brutality. This has existed for generations, right? This is not um, new. Um, and 
I think, you know, it really highlights, and especially for those who are Black um, and transgender, uh, the critical need to understand what is meant by intersectionality, um, you know, and, and how that plays out. Kimberly Crenshaw, you know, who really coined the term um, of intersectionality and explaining it as a lens through which we see where power um, comes and collides, where it interlocks and intersects, um, and it's simply, um, that there's a, it's not simply that there's just a race problem, but there's a, there's a gen, or that there's a gender problem, or that it's simply just a class or LGBTQ problem. Um, if we look at it that way, we are totally missing really the experience. And I had this opportunity to meet her um, a couple years back and just asked her about, you know, kind of the overuse of intersectionality. And she's like, the way to think about it is just a more um, critical and in-depth way to explain racism. Um, and to understand it and to understand especially the experience of, and oppression of black women, which is inclusive of trans uh, black women. And so, you know, I think definitely missing from the national dialogue is that, but I would like to hear you all kind of speak more also about the intersection of COVID-19 and um, the experience of police brutality and what that impact has on health and really what we need to do about it at this point in time. I mean, I'll, I can start. I, I, you know, I just think it's it's trauma on top of trauma. Um, I, you know, when you're when you're looking at COVID nineteen and what's been happening, and I remember at the beginning, there were a lot in some black communities that were saying, "Well, black people aren't getting it," and there was this myth that somehow we weren't going to get it. And I was like, "Okay, that's wrong. They're not collecting the data yet. Once we get the data, we're going to find out." And then once the data started to show itself, then we realized, and then we have to deal with this this bevy of media hype around, well, why are these disparities happen? They must not be wearing their mask. And you have like the Surgeon General getting out there saying, it's all about personal responsibility and you all need to do better and you all need to do it for your, you know, big mama and you know, all those other people. And it's just, it was just kind of an interesting thing. So we're dealing with that trauma. And then we're seeing people in our individual lives. I had a friend who was only 40 years old, lived outside of DC and he died of COVID-19. I've had other friends who have called me and been on the phone with me at talking about their symptoms and me navigating them through the hospital systems to figure out what's going on. And so you're seeing this COVID-19, you're seeing how it's decimating black and brown communities. You're dealing with it in your own personal life. You're worried about it for yourself and your families. And then comes along all the racist stuff that has always been there, but now there's just more video cameras. And it's like trauma after trauma after trauma. And then people always wanna to come to you to get your advice, to get to your thoughts on it, and you have to rehash it. It's like ripping off a scab time and time again. And so when you look at these intersecting things um, and these intersecting levels of oppression, and I think you coined it correctly. I think one pe a lot of things that people get wrong about um, Kimberly Crenshaw, the whole concept of intersectionality, it's not that we all have different social identities, we do. She was talking about spe specific intersection of identities that oppress black women. And it can that concept can be used as oppression of other groups as well. But I think we have to focus on that part. It's not just, hey, I'm black and I'm queer and I'm this and I'm that at the same time. It's almost that these identities allow yourself to be oppressed by society or subject you to discrimination and oppression by society. And I think just, it's been really hard. I can speak for myself personally and a lot of other friends that it's really challenging to have to do these things on top of navigating your work life, your personal life, your family, your romantic life, your need for intimacy yourself as physicians and as clinicians, which we sometimes put to the side. And so, you know, it can be really challenging. And I think the intersection of all these things has really done a number and it'll be interesting to see how we all are able to move forward. There's not gonna be a, a cookie cutter approach to what works, but I think we're all gonna have to struggle to find our way. Anybody else wanna comment? Um, yeah, I, th I think you had mentioned also specifically thinking about Black um, trans women in particular, and I, I'm just thinking about this past weekend here in New York City about, you know, how 15,000 people got together yep. mm -hmm. um, to say Black trans lives matter, um, and I think it was like a really robust sort of visual rebuttal of, of Friday's decision, which was wonderful, but I, I think about um, this quote that I saw um, Raquel Willis post on Twitter, which was that, um, like, we have a duty to elevate Black trans power, and I think Part of that is like, you know, amplifying the voices of Black trans women. So like a panel like this, like having, hearing the voices of Black trans women, like I don't feel like I'm, you know, as a Black cis woman, you know, 
be able to speak on behalf of my trans sisters, but I think it's also about, you know, sort of increasing that awareness, but also, you know, codifying like the not the non-discrimination, obviously, into law, um, which I think the Supreme Court decision on Monday helped to do. Um, but Raquel Willis also said, you know, she said white trans people are focused on legislation and black trans women, we're focused on our lives. So then, you know, thinking about, you know, you know, a culture change that we need in terms of really working on dismantling patriarchy, um, you know, and obviously homophobia, transphobia, which are all linked, obviously, to, to white supremacy culture. Um, so having those conversations and also just something that we do at the New York City Health Department is um, supporting trans-led uh, grassroots organizations um, to build their organizational capacity um, and expand services. And what this also does is provides employment opportunities for, um, for, for trans people. Um, so that's just some of those. And we also provide uh, psychosocial support funding to a number of agencies in the city um, to, who are specifically focused on trans women. Um, but we really need, um, really equitable access to the critical services um, with a focus on Black trans women and really elevating um, and supporting uh, Black trans women as well. So then from the, you know, provider uh, perspective, um, in, you know, mentioning, you know, last week uh, in Trump's uh, reversal of the policy, you know, what do we think are going to be the short term, and some of them already mentioned, but the long term impacts um, of a change such as what he announced um, in, in the policy and guidance, um, and especially at the healthcare kind of in, in, um, institutional level. Dr. Radix, can you speak to that um, since you're at Callan Lord and you all do lots of work and lots of advocacy and um, really just fantastic work over the years? Right. So the, sorry, I actually completely lost the, you went, it, you froze for a moment when you started. The, the question? Okay. Yes. I, so no problem. So in um, kind of continuing on what uh, Dr. Blackstock was saying, and, you know, last week, Trump's announcement um, about reversing the Obama era policy on, and, and um, about healthcare for those who identify as LGBTQ, um, wanted to get a sense of what we all thought were the kind of short-term and long-term impacts of that kind of reversal, uh, and especially at the healthcare um, institutional level. Right, so thank you. I mean, you know, it was strange because I think we all felt like we had a little bit of whiplash because, you know, that announcement came out and then, you know, basically in, you know, 24 hours, we had the Supreme Court uh, decision. I mean, I certainly, uh, uh, in where I work, we were incredibly concerned about what it meant, um, you know, specifically for uh, trans and gender diverse people. I mean, just the fact that, um, you know, access to healthcare, which is, is already problematic, but the thinking that people might even have the, those few avenues closed to them, people who've been waiting uh, years perhaps for gender affirming surgery and to see maybe those doors close. Um, the fact that people could be discriminated against when trying, even more so when trying to access care and the fact that they wouldn't have any protections around, you know, being roomed in uh, incorrect spaces when they're in hospitals. But, you know, we, we all, I should just say that we're already in a situation where uh, trans and gender diverse people have, lim you know, often in many places, limited opportunities to access care and face incredible amounts of discrimination. I mean, this has been going on for a very long time. So, um, and, and we're, we're always trying to, uh, to fight that. So, um, you know, we, we've heard the stories, physical abuse, uh, you know, verbal harassment in health settings. So the fact that this would um, now be almost condoned in a way and uh, was uh, incredibly problematic for the people I work with who are, um, who are LGBTQ, who are uh, specifically trans and gender diverse. Um, that was a day that most people couldn't, couldn't get out of bed, right? Um, because it Im has impacted us so personally. But anyway. I know that there's a, a lot that other people want to um, say about that, but I think mainly around access issues. 
you know, when I when I think about what the administration did um, in uh, making that unfortunate reversal, you know, I don't think the functional impact at a facility or a practice level is probably significant. I mean, my hospital is not going to throw out our non-discrimination policy mm -hmm. because suddenly it's okay. Um, but what what Dr. Raddox was talking about, I think, is critical. You know, we, we know that you know if if you lived in a state where the state had um, a ban on marriage equality prior to the Supreme Court decision in 2015, that your health was worse because of the stress associated with knowing that the government isn't on your side. Um, and suddenly we have this national proclamation that it's okay. And I, I think uh, it unfortunately um, gives uh, those who um, feel like it's okay to discriminate um, uh, more of a sense that they have a, a, a license and the wherewithal to, to do so. Um, I think that's the bigger impact than sort of uh, a functional uh, decision making at, at sort of a practice level. To add to what Asa and Jesse just kind of said as well, I mean, we know, right, transgender people in particular report that there's a shortage of healthcare providers that are knowledgeable about transgender medicine, right? And, zip. and that lack of knowledge is such a huge barrier, I feel like. And there's this huge lack of access that, uh, that exists. And physicians, even when like surveyed, say they don't have, and that there's a lack of training, there's a lack of knowledge. And I think what really concerns me is again, that kind of the administration saying, well, that's fine. You know, we, we need somebody that's actually pushing to get more um, access and more information out there. And for somebody to be, for, for the administration to give a pass, I think is so unfortunate. Right, and just, and just to add um, that we already know that um, LGBTQ and TGNC people already defer care out of concern that they're going to be discriminated against and because of, of experiences that they have had in healthcare being discriminated against. So that's just going to, I think, just further scare people for coming in. So I think you'll probably see more people deferring care or foregoing care, um, which obviously has the potential for substantial harm and potential like loss of life even. Um, so this is, I think, incredibly concerning. I do think though the decision on Monday, the Supreme Court decision, because of that though, I think there'll probably be a number of legal challenges potentially to um, Friday's announcement, um, which so hopefully we'll, we may see something um, happen in a, in a positive direction. Yeah, so, and that rings, so I get the questions just so that you all know as they're coming through and I try to, to pull them in and, and a question is kind of tied to that, knowing you know, what is happening, the political rhetoric and action. Um, you know, one of the questions is, so then what do we do, you know, during this time when people do fear speaking with their providers, you know, what what can we do and what, what should be done at this point in time? Because that, as you mentioned, um, Dr. Blackstock, that that is real and that is a fear kind of moving forward. What are actions that folks can, can make well, I, I think there's a lot of actions uh, you can take either as an individual um, or within your institutions, or even if you're not affiliated with an institution, you can start something yourself. So I think it starts with modeling your behavior and then also kind of being a voice, um, whether it be on social media or with a YouTube channel or with other kind of media outlets to put yourself out there to be that voice because you never know who's accessing the content. You never know who's listening. Um, I think there are also formal CME activities. I've partnered with several groups and organizations over the years where we provide, including the AMA, where we provide um, kind of training for providers uh, with regard to these things so people will be able to do that. Um, I also think on the flip side of that, it's also important that we work in communities. And I was part of an initiative with um, NASTAD, and I'm not gonna try to, since I know this is a live program, go over the entire acronym, but they're based in um, Washington, DC, National Alliance of State and Territorial AIDS Directors. Yes, I got it, and without a stutter. Um, so we worked on a website, two websites actually, it was called His Health, and then there was also um, one called Well Versed. And we were focused on training providers, um, specifically for black gay men, about some of the cultural intersections and some of the things you should be doing, both as a medical professional with the current guidelines, but then also bringing in some of the social contextual factors that are going on. And what was wonderful about that is that the His Health website provided CME credit and training modules that they could use. And that ranged from transgender health to whole health, uh, to linkage to care, to prep, all these kind of different modules. But then for the Well-Versed website, um, we actually did videos with members of the communities. 
And so it was more about the empowerment. So I think part of it was training the provider side to be more open or giving them information, but then also training the community and educating the community to say, hey, you have the power to demand more and you need to know these things when you walk in your provider's door. And if they say no at the beginning, this is how you should push these things and here are the resources that can help you with that. So I think when we think about practical things we can do, there are a lot of levels that we, uh, we can focus on those uh, as far as solutions are concerned. Absolutely. Um, Dr. Ehrenfeld, you know, now coming off of being your chair of AMA and um, very much helping to push forward lots of policy at the AMA level, um, and, and Chopin, you as well, we're going to come to you too. Um, can you speak to um, some of the work AMA has been putting forward as it relates to um, LGBTQ health and really sure. encouraging sure. physicians to take the lead in? Yeah, well, well the AMA has been deeply engaged in education, advocacy, and, and policy work to improve care delivery and health outcomes for the LGBTQ and transgender nonconforming community. A lot of that work guided by an advisory committee, which Dr. Patel um, chaired an, until uh, a few weeks ago. Um, there's a whole bunch of free online education resources as a, as a part of Pride Month. Um, an LGBT health diversity and inclusion online CME bundle was rolled out on the AMA Education Hub. Great, check it out if you haven't already seen it already. Those sessions provide vital information that uh, has been hard to get at in the across the provider community. Um, I've got a paper in academic medicine coming out that looks at training requirements across all of GME. Um, guess how many you know training programs uh, have requirements around LGBTQ health? Not many. Um, check out the paper. Um, there's, the AMA has done a lot, obviously, on, on the policy front in terms of trying to stand up for what is right in terms of trying to drive action at the federal level within HHS and other parts of the federal government. Um, you know, coming back to that Supreme Court decision, you know, the, the impact is likely not to be immediate because, again, you're talking about a decision around federal employment law, healthcare law is a different space. Um, but as was mentioned, there are likely to be profound implications. It's going to make any legal challenge uh, to the administration's rule much more likely to succeed uh, when courts start looking at laws that talk about sex discrimination in this way that includes sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, the AMA through our um, uh, Advocacy Resource Center and Litigation Center has been very active in many cases, uh, trying to um, use all levers uh, at our disposal to uh, advance those interests. And uh, it was a pleasure to uh, serve as, as chair of the board um, and frankly, to be the, the first openly gay person on the board of trustees. And, and I have to say, you know, you asked earlier, what, what can we do? The question came in um, as individuals, as members of communities and as providers. And, and look, we're all, we're all physicians on this panel. Um, we have to demand accountability of the places that we work, um, the places that we engage with. Um, you know, you just have to look at the, the Human Rights Campaign's um, Health Equity Index, right? And so they, they push out every year um, hospitals and facilities can voluntarily participate in, you know, this ranking system where they, they look at policies and say, you know, do you have everything in place that you should or not? Are you adhering to best practices or not? Um, and lots of places have gaps. Um, those gaps shouldn't be acceptable, and we need to demand that they get addressed. So to add to, um, uh, there's a lot that, you know, the AMA has had some kind of long-standing policy in terms of LGBTQ health, um, and, uh, you know, there is, while, while it has grown, uh, it's continuing to grow, and so I think that we are constantly looking for more input from the community and whatnot. Um, you know, they really have, as Jesse said, done a lot in terms of advocacy, amicus briefs, uh, trying to work both at the federal and state level um, and partner with state medical organizations as well. Um, and I think to add to that, the other thing that I've been really impressed with over the last couple of years is they've started doing SOGI data collection for uh, the members of the healthcare community and hopefully creating some model questioning and we've worked with the community on that, um, that uh, they're trying to get uh, other hospitals around the country at least uh, to start modeling and including because I think it is so critical that we each of us in our community get counted. Um, and so I think that's important as well as, um, you know, Jesse alluded to the fact that we do have some educational material that's on the website. Um, that is over the next year, probably two years, will be expanded and we'll be working with a number of community groups uh, to make sure there is uh, up-to-date education. So what is there is going to uh, eventually be just a small portion of what will eventually be available. 
So um, I think there's a lot that each of us as individuals need to do, um, as most people on this uh, panel have said already. Uh, there's a lot of learning that each of us as healthcare providers need to do. We need to encourage our peers to do some learning um, and to um, help carry that banner forward. Got it. Thank you. So Dr. Blackstock, I wanted to go to you because New York City Department of Health, and I'm very biased, I will admit, from being there for the time I have been and just know kind of uh, just the leading kind of campaigns um, that have been put out um, over the last couple of years. Um, and more recently during COVID, you know, as we talk about what folks can do, you know, some of the very sex positive messages related to the realities of COVID and realities of folks still wanting to have and engage in sexual relations, you know, you all kind of, you met that mark. And so can you just speak to that work um, and, and you know, kind of why, why do you all go in that direction and why is it so important and how is it received? I, I'm actually, it was curious, like how that was received. It was shared widely, but I was just interested how it was received from folks. We developed a sex and, um, and COVID-19 guidance that came out about a month or two ago and then um, had a recent, a recent update and both garnered lots of attention. I think because we know like sexual health obviously is a part of overall health and, and well-being. So, um, you know, it's a priority for us. Um, and we also know that people are still having sex. So we actually just launched a few weeks ago a, a program called Door to Door where New Yorkers can order condoms and have them delivered directly to their, um, their, their homes and we literally like busted our budget. We have more, we're looking for more funds in 24 hours. So like people are like having lots of sex and they wanna be as safe as possible when they're having sex. We also have a program um, that allows folks to um, get a code that they can enter online to have an HIV home test sent to them. And that program is also doing incredibly well. And what it just tells us is that, you know, people, you know, we're human beings, sex, sex is an important part of, of intimacy. Um, and we want to be able to support New Yorkers in, you know, being as safe as possible and also helping them to reduce the spread of COVID-19. Okay, so I have, I have a question here, if I can just get my phone to work. Um, so I have, I have two questions. One is, the first starts, would, Sorry, would the panelists discuss their changing experience of being LGBTQ in medicine? A friend of a friend who was at a T5 institution was told to go back in the closet. I'm applying to med school and I'm concerned my interest in supporting people with non-traditional sexual reproductive health experiences won't be taken seriously. Any comments? You know, I, I'll just I'll just say I think that the profession continues to evolve. Um, I was told uh, a, a few years back um, that if I um, stood up and advocated for a set of LGBT um, inclusive policies, that it would be the end of my career in organized medicine. A decade later, I was the chair of the AMA as an out gay person. So there you go. Um, you know, I think, you know, we each have to make individual decisions about um, the work that we do and, and how we bring ourselves, our full selves to the table. Um, but I think that visibility is really important. Um, and I do my best to be out every day in every way that I can be, uh, because I think it's important to educate um, our colleagues about what it means uh, to be an LGBTQ person. Um, and whether you're uh, an LGBTQ person or an ally in the profession, uh, we all have work to do to make sure that um, people like that who want to come into the profession um, don't have to leave themselves at the door. Yeah, I would, I would echo that, what Jesse just said. I think you have to come with your full self to the table. I remember mentoring a medical student once who, on his personal statement, gave a story about how a good friend of his had been, and he's a black gay man, he, a good friend had been diagnosed with HIV, and that got him interested in internal medicine. He used that on his personal statement when he was applying to, not medical school, but to residency at the time, and his mentor told him not to, because that would call into question his sexuality. So when he gave it to me to look at, I shredded it up because I said, dude, this doesn't even sound like you because he had changed it into a narrative that he was concerned about HIV because of its impact on black women. And I said, 
that is true. I said, but your work has been focused on black gay men. So he changed it to what I said, change it back to what you originally thought it would be. He changed it and then put that in his personal statement and applied to residency. And he said, wherever he went for his residency interviews, all the directors said that, that the statement stood out for him or stood out for them, whoever the, the chairman was, whoever the residency director was. And he ended up getting into an amazing um, residency program in internal medicine and continues to do phenomenal work now. I would just say to the medical students, to the residents who are out there, when you're applying, this is an evolving process. So it doesn't end when you become an assistant professor, an associate professor, a full professor. It's a constant thing, but I wouldn't term it as coming out. If any of you are familiar with the work of Darnell Moore, and some of his writings, he actually reconceptualizes coming out and says, look at it as more as inviting in. And so you are inviting, you have the power where you're inviting someone else into your space. And you're saying, you know what, you guys are worthy. You all are worthy of knowing my truth. And so I think sometimes I flip that on its end because the coming out paradigm sometimes can be very pejorative and ring very negative, although it is true for a lot of people that they feel trapped within something. But sometimes if you can think about it, that you have the empowerment here, you have the control over this, and you get to invite who you want into your space and just look at it that way. And like Jesse said, just show up to the table fully who you are and don't be afraid to be who you are. Um, and if they reject you for being who you are, then that's not the place you were supposed to be in the first place. Another question we have here. Um, I have a question concerning over susceptible, over the susceptibility to COVID infection of a person that is HIV undetectable. Is there data regarding this? Um, so I'll, I'll just speak for, for some of the data that we've been looking at at the New York City Health Department. So just to say that this is uh, evolving and we're, we're learning um, with everyone else. Um, so some of the preliminary data that we have suggests that um, people living with HIV are not overrepresented among lab confirmed COVID-19 cases. So um, people living with HIV account for about 1.4% of the New York City population and about 1.2% of lab confirmed COVID cases. We also do know that many people had COVID like illness and may not have had access to testing for whatever reason. We know that people who are black and, black and brown had less access. Could it be possible that there are some people, that this is an undercount in terms of um, cases among people living with HIV because at least in New York City, um, black and brown people are disproportionately represented. However, when we look at once people are hospitalized, once people die, it does appear that people living with HIV were more likely to be hospitalized, to need a ventilator, um, and to die from COVID-19. However, these are preliminary analyses. We don't know what, whether what's driving that is older age, because people with, living with HIV um, who had COVID tended to be older, um, whether it's related to higher prevalence of other underlying medical conditions, um, HIV itself, or all of those things. So we're trying to um, disentangle that right now and hopefully in the next few months we'll have more information. So just to say, it doesn't appear that people living with HIV are at higher risk of acquiring COVID-19, um, but it's possible that um, people living with HIV may have, have, do have worse outcomes, but what's driving that we need to figure out. There's no data to suggest that people who are virally suppressed are at increased um, risk of acquiring HIV or having worse outcomes. Um, Dr. Radix, did you have something that you were gonna add? No, I mean, I think that, um, you know, we've been talking a lot about uh, education and opportunities. And I, I just wanted to say one thing. I think that, you know, for a very long time for LGBTQ folk, we you know we've relied on like centers of excellence for LGBTQ care or providers who, like we know, like we can identify the folks like David in the community. That's who I want to go to for my sexual health care because, you know, he gets it. But, you know, you know, we've, you know, the gaps have emerged, right? What's ended up happening is a lot of these, a lot of the community health centers and, and folks aren't as available anymore because their offices are closed, the clinics have closed, and people are, you know, sitting at home and really concerned uh, about where to access their care and terrified. I've had patients absolutely terrified about going to, to go to the emergency room, short of breath and saying, I don't know where to go. I, I don't want to leave my house. I'm worried about, you know, 
I'm worried about the police presence. I'm worried about going to the agency. And, and, it, and a lot of that really is around the, the lack so far of mandated training. Yeah. And so, you know, in addition to saying, yes, people should, you know, avail themselves of, of all of this great information that's out there, we shouldn't really leave it up to people to decide whether or not they're going to <laughs> develop these competencies. Uh, you know, if you folks need to address, um, you know, be conscious of the of implicit bias. I mean, they have to do the work. And unfortunately, as I said, this, this pandemic has really exposed the major gaps in the system that are um, really detrimental to LGBTQ folks, especially uh, trans and gender diverse people. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, we, all, we have a, a little bit of time, um, but not really much time. Uh, I just wanted to speak with you each and just, um, this is another question that actually came up, um, is how have you experienced your own pride this month amidst all that is happening? Dr. Patel, do you want to start? Sure. Um, you know, it's it's definitely been a challenge, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, not having, uh, not being able to congregate publicly in terms of like um, your chosen family, I guess, and, and for lack of better words, um, and kind of celebrate together. And obviously there's not going to be any large gatherings uh, in the Bay Area by any stretch anytime soon. Um, so I think a lot of it has been uh, Zoom calls and kind of connecting in smaller groups, you know, we recently did a drag uh, bingo just by, uh, you know, Zoom calls and kind of just to talk about uh, what's happening and kind of there's been a series of kind of discussion groups that have happened around Pride and what's happening around the community as well. So it's it's been an interesting new way to connect. Um, and at the same time, it's also very exhausting to kind of connect that way uh, with all these Zoom calls and, and try and keep it together. So uh you know it's 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 a uh, cause for celebration in some senses and at the same time a chance for us to connect as as best as we can given the circumstances thank you dr malbrand well i would say i think the source of pride for me and it hasn't just been this month it's been um kind of in the course of this horrible year so far that we've called 2020 mm -hmm. um the, the thing that's really encouraged me is seeing a lot of people and particularly it, it reminds me there are some parallels with the HIV epidemic um, and people have been drawing that a lot since uh, COVID-19 hit. One of the things that I've seen that has been absolutely glorious to see is that while the medical and public health communities sometimes have been stagnant, the, the governmental response has a lot of times been stagnant. What I've seen is how our communities have mobilized and held Zoom calls, had informational sessions, webinars, podcasts, to disseminate information out to people. And one of the things that I think we learned from the HIV epidemic is that we can't wait for others to save ourselves. Like, we're the answers we've been looking for. And I think since we learned that in such a harsh way during the HIV epidemic, with COVID-19, a lot of people just stepped on the gas pedal and said, we don't have time to wait for you. We need to get this PPE out to the hospitals. We need to make sure testing is available. We need to make sure people are getting the most up-to-date information. We need to make sure that we're connecting. Since we can't connect physically, we need to make sure that our community is together and that we're seeing each other, we're uh, talking with each other, we're uh, exalting each other, and we're celebrating each other in the ways that we would be doing in person. But like Chopin said, it's just, it's frustrating but I think that's the, one of the silver linings that I see out of this is seeing how creative and brilliant and beautiful we are as a diverse community and how we've really rose to the challenge. Absolutely. Dr. Raddix? Uh, I think it's been really um, wonderful to see how innovative people have been and doing you know, on, online pride events and so forth. I have to say for myself personally, I, I haven't had uh, the time <laughs> or the energy to really uh, participate in anything. This is probably the closest that I've done. Um, you know, I'm I'm waiting for a better time uh, when we've maybe uh, passed some of these immediate challenges. You know. Thank you, Dr. Ehrenfeld. You know, it's it's funny. Um, 
when I think about what pride is and what it's become, you know, go back 50 years to 1969 to the Stonewall riots, where a group of very brave LGBTQ people stood up against police brutality and violence. And a year later, there was a celebration. And now 50 years later, here we are thinking back. And, you know, um, in most years, you know, I'd put on a rainbow t-shirt and go to a parade and, and hang out with friends. This year, I, I'm really finding instead thinking what does pride really reflect and what does it mean? And I think back to, you know, standing up for those who can't. Um, and I think about, you know, walking in my neighborhood last night with my black and brown brothers, um, taking a knee in front of my hospital for nine minutes to recognize the atrocities that police brutality have caused in our country. And for me this year, I think that I've been celebrating pride differently, but perhaps in a more powerful way. Thank you uh, for that. And Dr. Blackstock, you know, if I, I'm gonna go back to New York City, but you, you, you will be able to answer however you choose, but I feel like we would have been on a float. <laughs> Thank you. Down the street, right? <laughs> Dancing. Totally. <laughs> totally like I like I have to say like I, I am it's really disappointed and in mourning um, I don't know if many of you know I'm actually going to be transitioning out of the health department um, next month um, and was really looking forward to um, we'll talk David um, <laughs> was really looking forward to um, yeah be on our on our, our, on our uh, health department float um, but I think just sort of echoing what everyone else is saying I think being part of some of these collective actions in the street um, if, again, I think the, I'm really into like the intimacy, even though we don't, we can't really like physically be close, um, has really sort of like, I think helped um, sort of inspire me and like motivate me. Um, and so I'm just sort of using that. So like tomorrow I'll be out at like tons of Juneteenth things, probably by myself in and around Harlem. Um, but in some ways that is sort of like replacing some of the disappointment and mourning I have about, you know, just being at every Pride event this June. Yes, thank you. Well, we've reached the end of the show. They always go pretty quickly. Um, and uh, really just want to offer everyone happy Pride Month because tomorrow, happy June, Juneteenth. The AMA is actually having uh, their first half day uh, recognition and off for Juneteenth. So very uh, excited about that, uh, the leadership that is happening. So uh, again, thanks to all the panelists. Thank you for your time, uh, your leadership, uh, your voices, your work. I know you are all exhausted. It comes through. Um, we all are um, and just hope that we're able to find those ways to make sure that we are able to care for ourselves um, and um, be in, I think, I, I like your the words of intimacy, um, of Oni, um, the importance of that and finding those moments um, to help us uh, get through and carry us through these times. So thanks again and thanks for everyone for, for tuning in. Uh, and see you next time. Thank you. Thank it's you. literally a march going down my block right now. This is like amazing. <laughs> it's, it's like New York. This, I know it's like the celebratory dystopian <laughs> landscapes. <laughs> it is. New York is like that. The same. You're having the same thing here. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.